saw his dead relatives. They came out the other side in under an hour, freaked out and nearly empty of all resources. Two individuals went insane due to lack of comprehension of what they saw. They continued to frantically blabber about it in incoherent, mumbly yet high-pitched squealing voices, only calming down once the nebula was out of sight. This perked interest from Omic, one of the leading companies in anomalous research. They own and operate panopticons, anomalous planetary prisons that they research, while dooming subjects to its terrible jaws. If you're sent to Omic on death row, you're likely to be used as bait. Not my reason. As a researcher, I was to be dropped into zones inhabited by nothing but these anomalies. I haven't been dropped yet. They have months of training you must endure. I'm at the halfway point. Trauma protocol. Just after they teach you how to operate various equipment and you learn to scuba dive and space dive. But TP is where things take a turn. The first few months they hammer new reflexes and muscle memory into you. Plasma tech and its safe operation. How to clean it, that kind of stuff. Technological know-how is the last step before TP. That and paradoxal acclimation. The company I signed on to just so happens to have acquired the hard light, as mentioned above bridge, a synapse, as it's called. They want to utilize this for all TP procedures, and they just found a new spatial anomaly for me to investigate. Alone. This is averse to the regular TP, where you are dropped onto an incredibly hostile anomalous planet at one point with two veterans. You must trek the entire way from that drop point to the opposite pole of the planet for pickup. They often employ Lamia anomalies in these planets, mostly due to how aggressive and forthright they are. Instead, I'll be taking on a somewhat new anomaly, one they've labeled Dorian. Lamia are the most aggressive anomalies known, but the Dorian is their biggest competitor. While not outwardly aggressive, nobody has made it to the end of the bridge yet. Omix said that it's been a couple days since the last team entered, and that I should look out for them. When I asked what to expect, they said they have no idea. I got into the dock of the ship, and I prepared my equipment. Standard issue derelict gear. They were giving me the full loadout for this, despite me not having a license. Plasma cutter welder, a stupid useful tool. I had a choice between a Maybar rod or an escapole, and I went with the Maybar. Hard light bridge. I doubted I'd need to angle for predators to come find me. I was given a kinetic pistol and a plasma one. Finally, I was given the suit, a Delver suit. Full steel, they're meant for underwater exploration, and are incredibly heavy normally. What makes it a Delver suit is the addition of mechatronics, making the heavy thing light as a feather when you move in it. An exosuit at the back, you wrap the specific appendages onto yourself appropriately, and the mechanical spine basically does the rest. Small frame but bulky, there were bits removed for this model, given it's made for space diving. The helmet was geometric, with a pentagon-shaped faceplate and lightly blue-tinted glass, all around like a bauble, fitting comfortably if a bit awkwardly on my head. Beneath it all, I had my spacesuit, a skin-tight suit that went from my ankles to my neck. Over my whole ensemble, I put a token light blue omic jacket. With my gear, I sat by the hatch and awaited orders to step out. I was to be dropped right onto the hard light bridge. I had boots that are specially polarized to this bridge, ensuring I didn't just disconnect out of nowhere. The light bridge feeds energy into the boots, which feeds that energy right back into the bridge, causing a form of magnesis. Not as good as gravity, so all of my equipment is latched directly on my suit. Why the jacket? It's cold in space. I watched the stars fly by out the window against their matte black background. The powerful roaring from the engines was muffled into a tolerable, gentle growl. Compensating that was the electrical buzz of the lights, sneering as large orange bulbs struggled to squeak out the last of their lifespan, flickering occasionally. My seat was leather and rather soft. 
I could sink in a good amount and watch the cosmos shift around me. Just then, we were yanked out of jump speed, freezing the stars in the window, locking them in place. Red lights clicked on, and another powerful buzz joined the chorus of engineered music, bathing me in crimson as I rose and walked to the hatch. Not a word over the speaker, as the room expelled all of its air, and the hatch opened. There it was, gently whirring, as energy is pulsed within the nearby pylon, now dwarfing our vessel as we inched closer. A stark blue beam rocketed from its maw, launching into one direction forever, whilst blinding me with its powerful hue. Within reach, I dropped my foot onto the bridge and felt it slip into place with a magnetic click. Once stable, I looked to see my ship backing away, hatch closing. Not a word from anyone. They just left. I knew the procedure. It's easy. Make it to the other side. Before me were ripples in space-time, similar to the exterior of a black hole. This nebula warps space around it much more violently, however, as almost any individual ripple you could point out had this effect like looking through a magnifying glass from a distance. My feet felt odd. That horrible sense of apprehension you acquire directly in your ankles had arrived. That feeling that if you pull your leg up, your foot will get left behind, as if the joint is made of warm butter. My chest ignited with gentle embers every breath. My eyes fluttered and faltered. I feared I was getting comprehensive madness from just looking at it. The scale of such an object, the power required from a black hole to warp time, space, and light around it, apparently held within every individual, colorless strand. These strands reflected the bridge's light. The further they went from said bridge, the darker and more intangible they became. I looked ahead to see a warp in the bridge, far away but a warp nonetheless. The anomaly had a field wherein, if you step inside, your physical presence is shifted to an alternate place. This has been examined with plenty of other anomalies, but to just plop a bridge down in the middle of one the size of a planet without the restrictions? Seems reckless is all. Anyway, I managed to muster up the courage to begin walking. I had to adjust to the slight pull my boots had on the surface, but I grabbed my Maybar rod and approached the warp. Yep, I wasn't seeing things. A hard light bridge made to go in one straight line for a conceivably infinite amount of time had a 90 degree turn in it, banking to the left while spiraling. I was just dumbfounded. How am I supposed to get through this if the anomaly already messed up the bridge? This is why I have the Maybar, an extendable prodding pole with a scalpel the size of your face on the end of it. There are numerous sensors and colored lights, without being taught what it is. It's easy to assume the Maybar is simply a flamboyant spear. We use these in instances like this one. Inches ahead of me is the threshold to this spatial anomaly. I know the bridge is supposed to go straight, and it simply isn't. What do you do? Well, you extend the rod and poke at the spot where you think it should go. Voila, my rod hits the bridge with an audible zape, and an extensive plumage of plasma comes up. If I do the same on the path I see, no sound comes through aside from an audible whap, as if I'm hitting dirt. I pull the rod back and stab it into the bridge making the zap sound, and seeing the light of the plasma. I moved forward and found my boots sticking to the path I didn't see. Genuinely an awful experience, walking on an invisible bridge suspended in space. I look down and see infinity, same with above me, and to my sides. When I did decide to take a peek at my surroundings, I fell into a state of shock. I couldn't feel anything. My mind sounded an alarm muffled by water, and buzzing and ringing filled my head as my knees weakened. We call this anomalous contact. Just means there's an anomaly nearby. And that little alarm in your head that tells your body to run is going off constantly. You're expected to have dizziness, dry mouth, blurred vision, 
rampant thoughts, disorganized thinking, panic episodes, suicidal idealization, suicidal realization, and any pre-existing mental conditions you have will come out in full bloom regardless of medication. Thankfully, this is part of the training, and you're expected to continue onwards. This isn't my first contact, and the trick is just to keep breathing. I was walking with no floor, only an exploding light source in front of me to guide my steps through the anomaly, which began to shift and sway as I stepped through the threshold. Its colors shifted, the strands expanded and shrunk around me, and I kept walking forward, eyes trained on the light source. I'm not just here to survive. They said if I make it to the other side with some notes on my notepad, they just might give me a substantial bonus for each note taken. Oh yes, our notepads. Essentially, it's a black slab we write on. The words appear in bright blue font. It works fine underwater. And all of your notes are stored in your black box for later deciphering, letting the screen clear after each written page is saved. Think of it like an automatic notebook. Now I need this Maybar because it is not likely to lose the track, it'll stay inside of it and continue shearing through it. But I was ordered to observe. I'll attach my black box. Hopefully it'll contain something useful. As a quick summation, the initial stages of the anomaly feeling me out was that very shifting and moving. When you enter a field anomaly, it's like if you were microbacteria entering the human body. The body sends white blood cells and antibodies to attack and learn about it. This is a spatial anomaly, which is the same thing but bigger. They probe and prod what's inside them to learn about it, and hopefully rid itself of them. Unfortunately, this means that entering these fields makes the anomaly recognize you as a threat, an invader. Every anomaly acts differently to invaders, hence the investigation. Lamia Fields have a profound and unabashed curiosity with invaders. Supposedly, the other derelicts who deal in that case have been through some awful things as well. Describing the anomaly as if it was some creature driven by a brutal and sadistic curiosity with our inner workings isn't enough. A Lamia anomaly seeks everything about the human mind. That's what it's attacking when it's prodding and poking you. It invades your thoughts and takes them out of your control. Other anomalies like Illyria have little interest in our bodies and more interest in how we behave, so it's less hands-on with those involved. Illyria anomalies require further investigation, and Dorian anomalies have supposedly popped up before just without investigation. Primarily in machines and mechanisms, an entire starship had its engines and navigation taken over by a Dorian presence. The ship flew itself to a vague point in space where we found a planetary anomaly. I'm not allowed to know more about it, not till I'm done with this investigation at least, but we haven't seen much more from Dorian aside from it infecting devices or machines. The field felt me. It felt the bridge, and its movements almost resembled a form of regurgitation, as if it couldn't find a way to get these things out. I heard strange noises, mumbled voices pitched and warped into nonsense or blurred vocal tones, gargles and gums. They wrapped and flew around my skull like fish in a sea with no visual for what was making the sound. Just regurgitation, the clouds collapsed violently just to expand once more. My Maybar stopped exploding with light and delicately drifted forward suddenly. I hadn't changed my path. It's a straight fucking line but the rod was not hitting anything. Hell, I could put my arm under the invisible bridge. I had to keep calm, and it was very trying to do so when you had that awful audio confusing your senses and a terrible feeling that you're being watched. I spun around and poked behind me. I hadn't moved my feet, and there was no bridge. Finally, I poked right under me, and that pole went right between my feet. Panic filled my chest, my eyes sharpened, as I put away the Maybar rod and readied my plasma pistol. Charging it up halfway, I shot in front of me slightly down and to the left. The plasma struck something distant, and the anomalous interference disappeared. I saw about twenty feet away the entirety of the hard light bridge. It slowly revealed itself as the plasma chewed away at the anomaly, 
allowing its fluorescent body to extend in two directions again. I fired below me once more at half charge, and it struck something way below me, yet another bridge, but this time pointing perpendicular to the first one. My brow furled as I shot again at a random point. Once more, the damn bolt struck another bridge. I kept firing until about six bridges were visible, none going in what I believed to be the right direction, none underneath my feet. I was still there. I hadn't moved yet. I was frozen in fear, knees trembling as I tried to keep some form of orientation. Behind me was no opposite pylon, just the infinity I walked away from. In fact, all of the bridges extended far beyond the size of the anomaly, and the planets I could see beyond were unfamiliar and hard to recognize. I looked forward, or what I believed to be forward, and shot once more. A bridge appeared to my right a couple inches, and it was oriented in the same direction as my feet, so I stepped onto it, off some invisible platform, and began to walk again. Now fear and anxiety basked me in a new kind of sensation, that feeling of genuine human dread. Like having five minutes of air while being 900 M below the surface of the ocean. You're dead. There's nothing you can do but wait. Like falling into space disconnected from your line. Watching the only thing that was to keep you alive drift away slowly as you contemplate its failure at the task. Minutes of oxygen left to breathe. At the same time, you fly into a sea flipped upside down, falling into nothing, watching a star expand, seeing the stretch of your ship as you are pulled viciously and remorselessly into a black hole. You get to see the hallway connecting your room to the bathroom, become miles long as everyone is stretched to their absolute maximum. That feeling. I couldn't comprehend how I was to survive this and all I could do was follow the paths of light directed to nowhere. So, I followed. I walked forward diligently, knowing there was an end to this somehow. As I walked, my dread turned to depression, and my pace slowed. All around me were more bridges extending from nothingness actively. I wasn't shooting at anything. A bridge formed just above mine, the same sight of plasma fizzling the anomaly away revealed it. Then another just below, then one across that I had to step over, and another below that crossed one perpendicular to it, but angled off center from the grid. Once one bridge was off its angle, the rest formed willy-nilly, pointed wherever they pleased, and bridged the gap between any number of points. My eyes were fixed on my own bridge, ensuring I didn't step off it. I warred my pains of grief and sadness with this simple task and kept my mind on the end. Often, it's your humanity that dooms you when in the face of the unknown. The bridges continued their cascade of plasmatic growth, now angling themselves in peculiar shapes. They gradually formed a strange hallway, whose light was so profound I couldn't even see the end. I merely kept walking, eyes fixated on the blue haze forming beneath my feet. This haze turned gray, and soon the bridge beneath me had faded. In a moment my heart dropped. In the next I screamed, and finally I fell. Not far, I only fell a few feet from my initial standing point. No pain, not even discomfort just the airy breeze of a planet with atmosphere. My feet were now treading through dirt, kicking up a misty fog with each step. Around me were trees, peculiar ones, all of them gargantuan and overgrown on their own. They twisted and bent, racking up towards the sky and extending their branches into a lush overgrowth above me. The canopy quickly flourished with life, and the sounds of alien birds began to fill the air weird chanting music with drums and odd vocalizations from the forest. Walking alongside a stream, now searing its way through the dirt to my side, my hallway transformed from light to linen. Better than ligaments, I suppose, or tendons. Before me were nothing but trees bent into a circular maw through which I passed. Once crossed, my heart began to flutter. 
my eyes began to water and my mind began to bend. Signs of anomalous affection, something was off, and my chest reignited with anxiety as I rose my gaze from the path and gandered at my now whirling environment. The trees grew further, outgrowing its own leaves and tossing them away. Now its branches began to spider their way across an ever-dimming sky, skinny tubules that reached in every direction at once as they shot out. The bark fell, and behind it was a wall of mushy yellowish mass. The trees altered their shapes, flowering their branches and roots, making them grow further tangled in the canopies. Along their trunks, human fingers grew, elongated by six additional bones, hundreds sprouted, and they all pointed clearly at me. More specifically, my nose. My pace did not stagger throughout this. I instead whipped out the blackboard and got jotting down again. The field reacted nearly instantly to my anxiety as it spiked. It felt me the moment it did. The trees turned to nerves with fingers to fixate on the problem. I had no clue if this meant I was dead, or if it was merely observing me and the situation. The answer came swiftly, after jotting down my current state, I looked forward to seeing a grand mountain. The nerves were once again trees, evergreens it seems, or perhaps an alien deciduous plant. The mountain's path was traumatized, completely shattered and bare. I stopped and began to look around. I didn't remove my feet from the dirt, as I still had the sensation that I was suspended in space. The mountain was eerie. Its peak was peculiar to me, incredibly so. I thought I saw a streak of black mist coming from its dagger-like tip. It's a far trek, but I have a feeling that this anomaly wants me to climb. Perhaps it's an exit up there. I climbed some treacherous rocks that trembled and shook beneath my weight. I looked up at the pathway to ensure it was still present, though it also seemed to weave in different directions. Great. I climbed until I got to the first fork. The path on the right went up closer to the peak, but rounded it halfway, and the left one led up a nearby cliff and wrapped around the back of the mountain. My intuition told me the obvious route wasn't the correct one, and I chose instead to lead the left route. As I did some small trepidation consumed me for just a moment. My gaze fell to the ground, and I saw inchworms swarming beneath my boots. My stomach turned set itself on fire and tugged me forward. I stomped and stamped through them, though their number was far greater than I had imagined. I had been wondering if I made the correct choice. Perhaps the right path wouldn't have had these little devils beneath its mud. Pretty quickly, however, I reassured myself of my decision, and the worms stopped squirming. I looked down and they had disappeared. Even the gore stuck to my boot was gone. I sighed with a strange sense of ease. The anomaly sought symbiosis, but responded badly to my anxiety. These all were random effects of the process. Dorian, Illyria, and Lamia all have the same thing in common. They require a host or vessel. Spatial anomalies are different. They don't need a host or vessel, because their power is great enough to spawn a nebula to act as one. As such, when an invader enters, Symbiosis is forced upon it. These visuals, these effects, all of it is just the anomaly, attempting to reach total symbiosis with me. Once I do reach that level, the field will begin to see into my mind, and it shall build things for me. I don't know its purpose, I don't know what it shall bring, and I genuinely fear it. Full symbiosis will be obvious once it occurs. The field will have its fingers in my nerves, and it can control my stimuli down to a T. From my perspective, I won't notice a thing, however. I'll just think I'm going mental. This moment came sooner than I expected. I could feel my lungs filling with cool, almost minty air. This minty feeling turned to a sincere burning, and I could feel my muscles begin to twitch. My skull fell forward, barely caught by my legs. I held my helmet for a moment and glared at the ground. The dirt grains began to shift, sway, and flow. They moved around my feet, 
rushing between them and piling behind me like dry waves. I looked up to see the pathway becoming clearer, calmer, and cleaner. Gentle bushes of green and trees of emerald began to lavish the landscape, inundating the path with dense foliage, so much so that it began to forsake the light. A towering canopy above me shielded me from almost all brightness, and the path was now speckled with golden hues barely escaping the leaves' grasp. I continued to walk along the path, slouched and relaxed. My muscles felt like jello, and my bones felt like rubber. My skull pushed and pulled from the upper mandible, as if my neck connected directly to the lower jaw alone, leaving me bobble-headed. I opened and closed my mouth as my head dangled in rhythm with my step. My eyes had been glued open, perhaps stapled, and my vision remained in a tunnel fixated ahead of me. It was almost soothing and relaxing to be on this mountain. Flowers even bloomed to accompany me as I walked. The path was almost exclusively switchbacks, leading directly up its peak now. Steep, they made my suit begin to wear on me, and my legs now burned from my walk. Each step felt like hot ice scorching through the veins. It was strangely… pleasant. On the walk up that mountain, I'll never forget, the number of times I nearly fell became more and more as I approached the top. Before long, the peak was in view. I gazed at it, then at the surrounding region. I could see where the field was failing to maintain this illusion. Wobbly trees or flora sprouting in unnatural ways. You could peer through them slightly to see stars. Still, it remained one hell of a sight. The very tip of the mountain literally stabbed into the sky, creating a fine gash that closed a couple of feet away, in the direction of the wind. The path became narrow as hell being only a foot across once you reached that peak. There I sat, just beneath the gash, unaware of how long I'd been walking, unaware of how far I'd gone. I just glared at it. I watched as the tip delicately ripped one end of the sky and opened it along only for it to taper closed once more. The gash was larger than me, and I assumed the field wanted me to go through it. Red mist exuded from it, tinted with a blackened brown color. I instinctively held my breath as I plunged my head through. A wash of crimson intensified on my visor, liquefying and dribbling off my helm. All around me were crimson clouds, mountains adrift in a sea of screaming madness. Beyond me, I could see nebulaic clouds in the sky. Trees far more vicious in appearance than usual flourished around me. Flesh twirled and twisted around limp tree branches, fingers curled and hooked into the curved underside of my boots, to be removed viciously as I took each step. Skin folded across plains and prairies, teeth gnarled and mangled beneath these sheets. You could see them moving just beneath the surface. I could see the sun in the distance. No clouds dried skin, and fiery forests, and all the while, the sun bled. Its light dripped into the horizon, filling it with an intense red glow. The mountains turned to boulders and the boulders into pebbles. A tremendous racket had thundered, sounding like the world was falling into itself. Something was coming. It tore through the landscape carelessly, uprooted oceans where they lay and dug the entirety of this planet out just to approach me. A wholly determined monstrosity gouged the mantle and tore the core. I couldn't see anything. There was no form to it, just a rampant path of chaos and destruction to hint at its location. As it came closer, the world became less powerful, its peaks shredded into ash, consumed by the growing glow on the horizon. All the water evaporated in a wave, and while it burst and erupted from across the prairies in my direction, the water in a nearby lake stood still. Quickly, unbelievably, the lake vanished into hot air instantly, and the consuming mass was upon me. I closed my eyes and hobbled backward, pleading and crying to the wave of destruction. The noise of the world crashing upon itself ceased and was replaced by the dim, 
hollow, and eerie emanation of the bridge. The whirring buzz was comforting in a way. Below me was the everlasting blue, and I instinctively impaled it with my Maybar rod. The plasma reacted violently at the tip, and I was finally met with a sense of relief. I was on my side lying down, so I rose and got moving. My skull swirled with airy apparitions and hallucinatory thoughts of days never spent. My chest was light, and my spine felt gelatinous. I moved with a strange sway and rhythm to keep myself upright. The path was forward. That's all I needed to remember. I started to walk, keeping my maybar paved into the bridge. I leaned my weight into the spear more intensely as the minutes passed. The galaxy around me brimmed with its delightfully grim ambience. So quiet it's deafening. Only the sound of the plasma assaulting my maybar rod and my magnetic boots intermittent locking and clicking. I had no perception of how far I was. My legs felt weak, and within moments, I had finally collapsed on the ground. Around me, the stars danced, joyously celebrating my defeat, anchoring me in the cosmos so I may never forget my place within it. Now that I lie still, I could hear the anomaly. Its voice came through. Not a clear one, mind you, and not wholly unpleasant. I could hear it speak in broken tongues with a vaguely aggressive tone. It sounded similar to someone talking to themselves, fighting or arguing. It was deciding what to do with me, how to use me now that I was in its gut. I saw the nebula clouds moving and motioning in strange ways again. This time it seemed like the clouds were exploding backward, imploding in on themselves. These motions remained until they eventually calmed and the color of the clouds began to show as light yellowish gray, with spots of blue, teal, and magenta. Light that struck the clouds was inverted, with the side opposite to the light becoming more luminous, while the side facing the light became dark. This was despite the blue glow of the bridge, which, yes, mimicked this effect. Some clouds remained connected to the overall mass, this mass being the largest sized cloud that moves slowly. It lies below the bridge. Above me was a wild canopy wherein most of the action took place. The fingers of whatever cloud may be below rose above me to heights undreamed of. There they move in intricate and delicate ways, attempting to form shapes that I can understand. It formed a spiral, a square, and a star. This was before it began making different shapes, looking like loose twine wrapped around an invisible entity. The web canopy was set upon pillars. To my sides was the broader anomalous mass, mostly cloudy tendrils leading to its fingers or massive trunks, similar to twisters leading to other cloudy sprouts above. Some of these clouds began to move far more than usual, and they even began to swing over the bridge. When one swung close enough, I peeked at what was inside. Enormous, sprawling masses of ferrofluid, or a similar magnetic liquid. My face unfortunately entered the cloud directly, so for a moment I was in deep terror. Inside the clouds, no light moves, only that Stygian fluid which whips powerfully around my visor. The fluid makes up most of its mass, and is constructed very carefully on the inside with stark pillars of the substance standing in many of the largest cavities, the rest maintaining smaller pillars between one another, while the majority of it moves and grows and shrinks rapidly, in tandem with its motions. When my head left the cloud, I received no damage, but spots of my helmet were covered in that fluid, which pointed its spines very prominently towards the closest masses of clouds. Once again, I received no damage, but ducking your head into a cloud and being met with swarming masses of magnetic liquid is a rather terrible experience. The fluid is black, matte black, as in even a flashlight couldn't shine through this stuff. It's unreal. Being covered in it is similar to dipping your head into a vat of ink, just nothing but cold black through the visor. When one swung close enough, I peeked at what was inside. Enormous, sprawling masses of ferrofluid, or a similar magnetic liquid. 
My face unfortunately entered the cloud directly. So for a moment, I was in deep terror. Inside the clouds, no light moves, only that Stygian fluid that whips powerfully around my visor. The fluid makes up most of its mass. It is constructed very carefully on the inside, with stark pillars of the substance standing in many of the most extensive cavities, the rest maintaining smaller posts between one another. While most of it moves and grows and shrinks rapidly, in tandem with its motions. When my head left the cloud, I received no damage, but spots of my helmet were covered in that fluid, which pointed its spines very prominently towards the closest masses of clouds. Once again, I received no damage, but ducking your head into a shadow and being met with swarming masses of magnetic liquid is a terrible experience. The fluid is matte black, as if even a flashlight couldn't shine through this stuff. It's unreal. Being covered in it is like dipping your head into a vat of ink, just nothing but cold black through the visor. The next phase of the clouds began, with the nebula pulsing through its whole mass. My feet and arms felt heavier, and the shearing cry of the plasma to my maybar still rang out, but now it was piercing. My breathing slowly quickened for no apparent reason. My body began to quake softly, without an obvious signal, and my mind began to race with thoughts of what was wrong when nothing seemed amiss. My pace slowed to a halt, and I hung my head down. I looked at the tip of my maybar still pierced into the electric bridge, the noise it made becoming more prominent the longer I glared. My eyes followed it, from its glaive-like head to my hand. That damned noise, like a crackling fire, heard over the speakers during a voice call, if the microphone was plunged into the cooking embers. The noise turned from an electric crackle into screaming, sounding like children bickering in some distant dimension. I couldn't move. My knees felt like rectangles stacked upon one another, like bending them would break them. The clarity of those sounds just dumbfounded me. The clouds slashed and whirled delicately around the bridge and me. It was evident that I had to keep moving, but I couldn't attain the strength to lift even one foot. I could only feel my eyes reluctantly maintaining their stare, and I could only hear the electricity strike my maybar to create more audible, electronic squealing. Ruminating on what would happen if I were to pull the blade out of the bridge, certainly that ear-grating noise would halt but the thought of getting lost was causing trepidation. I warred over this, angrily contemplating with a pained grasp on the rod, my grip becoming shoddy and shaky as I wondered. If I were to release the blade of my maybar, the nebulon could distract me from my path. It would lead me off the bridge and into its dangerous hands. Again and again, I ran over the situation in my head. I could feel the tire tracks from these thoughts that raced on my skull. A certain invisible momentum was building as they skewered through, causing me to nod and rock my upper body while I walked. As I tried to think on this, the nebula was all too eager to make itself present. The clouds slammed and slapped me, passing through and gifting me with momentary, absolutely terrifying darkness. My grip did not fade but neither did my gaze. I was horrified to see my lack of action, how petrified I was at losing this bridge. The clouds danced around me, closing in and tightening themselves like walls. Within moments, I was in a new phase. The clouds turned to streaks, infinitely long threads whose individuality was quickly recognized, ever distant from me, yet close enough to touch. These threads formed a barrier around me, a grid pattern to keep me in my place. My body still refused to respond. I could only imagine what would happen once these threads finally nicked me, as the grid still encroached on me. Perhaps, like laser wires, they will slice and dice me a million ways to Sunday. Maybe they will act as ludicrous arms that will crush me. Or they may even be the strands of a jellyfish possessing some neurotoxin held within barbs that will impale my flesh and cause seething paralysis. As I thought, 
I found a strange comfort in that contemplation. The thought of my death was soothing. No pain, no fear, no anything. Perhaps death is more appropriate for me. Ideas meant to be forgotten, discarded, burned. These pessimisms are fruitless, yet I was so attracted to their ideation. With eyes half closed, drifting into an abhorrent and willful coma, I had to act. So, I reaffirmed my grasp on the Maybar and pulled with all my might. The sound rocketed in volume, becoming a deplorable child's scream as the bridge reconstructed the torn plasma. This screaming quickly halted, and I could finally hear the nebula. Like oceans had flooded out of my ears, a weight that was once there finally gone, pressure insurmountable exuded en masse. The grid collapsed instantly, wrapping itself around me with millions of individual strands, all tied vigorously in neat rows. I could feel its strength. It squeezed my torso and bent my spine. My arms were now stapled to my sides, still gripping the Maybar. Only my legs were free. Only them and my skull could move fully. Once the wrapping died down, I was left with a massive bind around my entire body that was hooked into a broader network of wires. They tugged me, forcing my feet forward. It wanted me to walk, so I did. I looked around, curious about my captor. I wanted to see what was holding me in place, a fair question to ask. Above me was more of the nebula, though the clouds, saturation, and vibrance had calmed, only becoming colorful once the strands came closer to me. These wires continued to weave around me, and I was there trying to understand where the bridge was. Now and then, I'd roll my body to the right and twist harshly, straining my wrist and scraping my maybar against whatever was in front of me. Though this method was used in sparse moments to avoid tipping off the nebula, I could keep track of where the bridge was despite my capture. The grip was tight, but loose enough that I could breathe, or perhaps the strands themselves were more elastic than they first appeared to be. Whenever I tried to pull my arm out, the strands would strengthen and tighten, slowly. Below me were more wires, all of which slithered through the expanse and around me. Miles away, I could see the mesh of wires becoming more focused and less hectic above a swishing overgrowth of said threads. They would weave and sew into taut positions, never remaining still for too long, seemingly keeping me suspended through just these wires, a series of ropey pulley systems, lines extending into infinity beyond me. In my mind, a thousand doubts and regrets shattered my comprehensive veil. Like glass shards, my thoughts were met with sharp, retaliatory ruminations of distressing memories long forgotten. Before me lies infinity woven through the strands of a crimson nebula with no business being this alive. I was filled with despair once again, and my knees grew too weak to carry me. I swirled my body once more to glimpse the bridge, only to fall moments later into the grasp of my binds. They did not let me strike the ground. I fell over, and they dangled me on my side. I started gasping. My existence was faltering again, my presence in the here and now disintegrating. I figured this was the moment I had been waiting for. Shall these tendrils of infinity crush my spine and crunch my bones? Surprisingly, no. It held me aloft and continued forward, flipping me onto my stomach as it drifted me above the bridge, flying mere feet from the plasma. I tilted my Maybar's edge into the ground, and sure enough, the bridge was there. Plasma erupted from its thin body below. I was being carried across the bridge. This served to aid in my reality. It gave me minor light amidst the encroaching dark. For a moment, I had forgotten about the anomaly in my mission. I was just adrift in the palms of something I'll never fathom. Its grip loosened, and the clouds returned once more as the wires vanished into smoke. Delicately, it lowered me onto the bridge, which I instantly impaled again to save myself the worry. The squealing returned immediately, a screaming plasmatic reaction I had grown attached to. Now, 
I was approaching the epicenter. This meant the anomaly would have much greater control over what was happening. Like a storm, it has layers, even as an impossibly large nebula. The outer edges catch people, and the anomaly pulls them into its more substantial, deeper parts. I stood where I landed, glaring at my Maybar with the invisible bridge. The sound of it oscillated in my ears, as if my brain was in the process of a lengthy, corrupted reboot. While I was exhausted and possessed every reason to duck off the side of the bridge, I almost took this as a sign. Its grasp was wavering towards this point, meaning the epicenter has a region where its metaphorical controls switch. The further you go, the grander its display can get. I was standing in this exact region out of sight, out of mind, a layer between the outer limbs and the chaotic epicenter. The anomaly wasn't even reacting to me. It was frozen in weight. I stood at the precipice of this terror's most powerfully passionate show, and it couldn't even force me through the circus gate. This region between the exterior and interior is a theoretical limbo, wherein the anomaly cannot have any sway over you. It was a reality check. I realized that this thing, however vast and complex it is, still has flaws. It isn't some perfect killer or consumer. It's a reactionary villain. If so, how many other anomalies have theoretical dead zones in their reach? And how could this benefit us? Instead of clutching the head of my Maybar and plunging it cleanly through my throat, I opted for note-taking. Crouching down and spending a fair amount of time jotting observations, I put my Maybar down with the tip pointed away from me, as the edge was becoming unnerving. At this moment, I found a certain hope, a passion, if you will. Maybe it was born from the same curiosity that made me into a derelict. Perhaps it's the end result of TP, or maybe I just want to see these fuckers die out. It was a light, all I needed. I just had to push through this epicenter. I'm about to cross into the middle of this thing and make it to the other side. I need to keep moving. Keep noting. If I do make it through, I'll be the first to have utilized a synapse, seen the Dorian, and survived the largest type of anomaly. Crossing the barrier was like dashing through a molasses block stuck in space. Instantly, I was much warmer, and I could feel pressure as if underwater. My limbs' movement was unhindered, but slowed, like slowing down time. This effect became so pronounced I couldn't even continue writing, taking two whole minutes to simply reach to my back and put the damn tablet away. I could feel trepidation in my muscles as they shook and twitched, tremors that exuded and somehow loosened this effect. Curiosity peaked. I started to nod my head rhythmically, and sure enough, the cosmos began to loosen its grip on my neck. The bridge appeared as a thin sheet of blue, barely emitting light beneath its thick, if stretched skin. Just nodding my head was making things move again. Distant objects became more precise, but of course, I'm bouncing my head up and fucking down, so I can't see anything. This is where things got strange. I could feel the motion in my torso, pelvis, legs and back and my muscles moving acutely in their exact muscle groups, sore. All aside from my neck and head, which I was utterly unable to feel, though they stayed in motion. My eyes felt like fish, and my flesh was growing sore. I was exhausting myself even further. The rhythm remained the same, and my surroundings moved like shadow puppets on the walls, congealing into masses of red and black eventually masking itself with dire monuments of stone piercing from beneath layers of epidermis. Large enough to cover the shocking landscape with silhouettes that further veiled the increasing complexity sewn through organs now weaving up these towers, moving like serpents and millipedes, whole organs and organ complexes resembled arthropods, arachnids, and bodies that appeared to sprint up the wall, people, all this was hidden by the monuments, as were the surrounding stars. Beset on all sides by mountains of humans constructed of clouds, clinging to towers covered in organs, 
I could hear the sound of their gored innards and exteriors snapping, winding, tightening, and binding into place, with gooey overgrowths infecting whatever structures existed. Finally, I was surrounded again in dark, empty black. Before me, a stream of dim energy which undulated and shifted however it pleased over the course of miles, infinity. I could see no end. All sounds began to fall into a deaf ringing in my right ear, and then my left. The bridge shifted and moved again, and as I looked at my Maybar, I realized something was wrong. This wasn't the field anomaly obfuscating the bridge. Something was wrong with me. My eyes were failing. My ears, too. My whole body began to move on a swivel beneath my skull, terrified that I may outwalk my mind. I couldn't feel my head, but I could feel my skull. It's difficult to explain such a sensation, but it's like having a headache at the very base of your cranial cavity. Imagine if nerves grew across your skull, but the ones in your skin all died. The pressure was mounting from within. My biggest tip that something was off was my eyelids, the lower of which began to bulge and pulse with warm fluid. I could hear the echo of flesh stretched beyond its limit, but it felt like it originated from within. A fleshy, wet snapping followed by pains through my body, seemingly reflexive. Soon, the pressure pounded beneath my crown, pulling, tugging my entire body upwards like an angel yanking me to heaven. That stretching sound was getting louder. It resonated strongly in both my ears, and I couldn't feel most of my body. My toes were snapped forward, and my knees fully extended. I could feel the kneecap separate from its socket, and become suspended between the bottom of my thigh bone to the top of my shin. Suspended in a sheet of my flesh and cartilage, now torn from its position. Toes also dislocated from their positions, stationing themselves forward in front of my moving body. Both my legs were tearing at the bottom of the pelvis. Soon I could feel my spine delicately click apart one by one. Eyes were pulling forward like they had no reason to stay in their sockets, nothing to latch them in, only ghastly hands to pull them away. I watched as those sockets disappeared from the periphery of my view. My eyes didn't grow dry from this. They only got more wet as a viscous trail of blood skewered at the edges of my vision away from me. Finally, I could sense my teeth, as if they had nerves along their surface. It's challenging to describe that, but I could feel them like fingers detaching from their joints and freeing themselves, almost gently from my gums. I couldn't feel any pain. Just every movement with perfect precision and sensation, as if every single strand of me became enhanced by tripling its nerve count, adding nerves where none were before. Somehow my eyes drifted forward and tilted over, my vision turned down. Having your entire world tilt so freely and rotate around is incredibly sickening. I wanted to vomit, but, as I was able to observe, this was impossible. Yes, my diaphragm contracted painfully. It flexes into such a tense mass. Watching its heaving, I could only imagine what pain it must be in while anyone vomits. I saw my stomach. It couldn't respond as it floated about a foot beyond the cavity, where it was supposed to rest. All of my organs drifted from my body, spilling in front of me as if there were an invisible table they lay upon. In a line, all my entrails were pulled from their places and displayed perfectly on the said hidden platform for the universe to see. My bones soon took part in this. At the front of my rib cage and base of my pelvis, I felt fault lines sear through the flesh, pulling out their center point and propelling the front half of my rib cage onto the table. It landed on the liver and stomach, holding within itself a lined, stringy connection of fleshy strands that suspended my lungs into a desperate float within the cage. They quivered, shaking and inflating only to stay that way once the diaphragm disconnected. I could feel the connected tubes. This was a momentary lapse in attention that nearly cost me my life. 
I looked for my Maybar, the plasma that reacted with the bridge, any semblance of consistency. It's not easy when your eyes aren't cooperative, but the muscles haven't broken off, meaning if I attempted to look up. My muscles reflexively contracted, and I could feasibly throw my eyeballs around with the optical nerves keeping them attached. Each time I wished to look to my left slowly, there was enough torque from the flexing muscles to spin them 180 degrees around. When I found the rod after minutes of thrashing my vision with acute muscular flexes, the colors had changed on its edges, becoming a vicious pink. I managed to chuck my ragdoll body around, as ligament and tendons kept the more significant portions from falling apart, but only barely. My feet were inoperable, and my legs were... I seemingly lost count of how many limbs had appeared. The flailing managed to drift my loosening hand towards the rod, and I latched onto it with all the force I could muster. Another flailing session and the end of the Maybar struck the plasma into a beautiful blue explosion. This grounding in reality shot me back into my entire state. My organs slurped back into me, and my flesh and skin sewed themselves together. Once mended, I could only reflect on the fact that I could feel it. Still, I could feel all my strands of flesh hugging one another tightly. Now they twitched in utter disgust at their displacement while tightening slowly, in careful positions to replace themselves. My body felt sick. My knees were weak. I wasn't about to trust it to stay together. I fell and struck the light bridge with my face inches from the reaction my Maybar caused. The sparks could have very quickly carved through my face. They could have disintegrated my bones and sliced right through into my brain. Instantly, I recoiled and got up, clutching the rod with all my might. A wavering grasp and weakening spirit were now ever-present as I shivered while remembering the incident. I managed to stay upright on one knee by leaning into my Maybar. It remained still amidst my thrashing and flailing drunken movements, akin to that of a regular, in a pub leaving at the crack of dawn. I panted, gasping for air while patting my body. I was fine. I was okay. I just needed to reaffirm that I was constantly. My heart began to palpate. I could feel its muscular form slamming against my ribs. Ribs that stood in place, unmoving against the powerful pulsations. My panic began dying, and I looked for a way to orient myself further. The bridge had disappeared entirely, though I remained on some platform. For all I knew, the reaction wasn't real. Maybe the anomaly has tricked me completely. If you don't pay 100% attention to what's real, the anomaly sees it as an opening. You can't even drift off into a daydream. I must have had a moment where I did so. Clawed from reality for simply being disinterested in walking forever. Thousands of questions seared through my mind, as well as theorized answers. Assumptive answers, too. I thought that the true intent of the trauma protocol is to prepare someone for the mental consequences of minor mistakes. It's no joke. These mistakes are punished by reigniting something within, something terrifying and primal. Maybe the anomaly has been searching for that something, and only here in its epicenter can it finally touch it. But for what reason does it seek this? What is it reigniting? I tried to think about it but feared that my thoughts were being surveyed, so I changed my train of thought at the time. I just got up and kept moving like a walking corpse. I held my spear in the bridge. The plasma may still be guiding me, but for all I know, the anomaly had already swallowed me. I blinked, and light bloomed around me. Blinding stars from the sky fluttered towards my person, engulfing me in a flat landscape. The bridge was evident. I could see the plasmatic reaction clearly now, and the bridge itself was rebuilding out of a blue glow. It was, however sunk beneath magenta waves. The liquid bubbled, but never burst at the plasma, like blowing air through a straw into milk. 
Bubbles simply formed and spilled over themselves at my feet. This liquid wasn't some dairy product. It was water. You can see the bridge's cyan color very clearly through it. Light penetrated it easily. Yet when met with plasma, it seemed to thicken. Curious. I wanted to reach for my notepad but found myself unable to. My arm wouldn't move. I could feel motion, walking forward like I wanted to, but stopping proved impossible as well. My gaze cast downwards. I found nothing but bones, purplish and grayed. Looking at my arm, I could only see my legs moving in perfect fashion through it. They marched onwards, my whole body limping against the maybar. I couldn't feel anything now, not a single thing. I was a skeleton that had volition. Simply, it was a skeleton that danced through an ocean planet on a glimmering bridge, lying just a foot below the surface of its waters, completely numb, dumb, and happy, marching forward in a sea that did not resist me, just surprised me. My bony feet were surprisingly hydrodynamic, and my march had a jaunty pace, a rather lovely rhythm as well, one that beckoned thoughts of dancing and entertainment. Beyond the magenta, the sea turned to a powerful scarlet, which decayed into faint pinkish tones on the horizon, lit well by a star that revealed this planet's atmosphere. Clouds of reddish tones against a mostly pink sky, with a fair amount of blue dabbling the horizon like watercolor. For miles, nothing was evident, though occasional waves would splish along my bridge. One such wave came along as a huge undertow, ready to tear me off the bridge to be cast into what I can only assume to be the gut of this anomaly. As it passed over, however, it simply wafted through me. My skeletal body left little for the water to cling on to, and my clothing was dry. Away from me, I could see more waves, appearing powerful and tall, as if a storm perpetuated over the whole planet as an invisible force. I still marched on, my arms swinging with the same rhythm my legs stomped to. My head was throbbing by this point, and I felt a slow line of warm liquid bleed from my non-existent nose. I continued to march despite this. My teeth felt dry, like I had been smiling for too long. I could taste only blood. My tongue felt caked in the dense substance, a dry, thick material similar to oil. My eyes moved like fish in a bowl again, swirling into position and encrypting my surroundings into unintelligible blurs. Smears which I followed, colors guided me more than anything. My feet followed the blue and evaded the magenta. I began to move forward by forcing my weight into the maybar. When my vision corrected again, I could feel the slosh of dormancy in my skull like a dumbbell knocked to the side in a tub of water. My feet stammered. I had momentarily lost my footing and ability to feel my lower body. Then I suddenly reacquired said feeling, and it startled my reflexes and me into malfunctioning. Staggering against my maybar, I bolted forwards like my ass was on fire. All my weight toppled ahead of my toes. My arms and legs flailed almost playfully as I ran with sheer terror in my supposedly missing heart. Flamboyantly, my bones flopped forward. From the ocean, waves began to pull towards the sky, revealing people. Flesh exposed, eyes wide open. Gargantuan humans cast in patchwork skin. They watched me run with no motion. Many hid their faces aghast at the Olympic display. My sprint was punctuated by intermittent spurts of leaping, arms flailing in front of me rhythmically and playfully. I frolicked in tormenting fear and confusion through the meaty ocean planet. From below, I saw an abyss form, like black ink pumped into the bottom of an aquarium. I charged through faster than ever. My surroundings shifted, and I could feel my feet again. I turned around to a quiet sea. I faltered to a halt as I felt my legs again, like my other ligaments, sudden sensations blinded by shattering tiredness. There was naught but a still, calm, quiet sea that sat flat, with no waves or people. All around me there were no landmasses, 
just water. The ocean had turned limpid and dark crimson, motioning into a stranger abyss. The shock of my senses returning to me, I saw my arms again, covered by their omic jacket and gloves. Contrasting the ghastly crimson was a ghostly gray, two oceans pressing against one another, vortexes mixing the color into the lifeless waters. Through the horizon you could see its length, how it likely wrapped around the circumference of this place. Vortexes spewed from this line, rotating violently then calmly as it drifts into the open ocean, intertwined in a beautiful circle to be dispersed moments after. I decided against poking at this one and instead pressed forwards, skull bobbing up and down as I walked. My arms felt like sandbags tied together with loose twine, legs felt like bricks being pushed forwards and stacked haphazardly as my feet met the bridge. The sky was no longer pink, it was white, with clouds that engulfed hidden blue hues. They moved swiftly, gouging themselves and swallowing one another regurgitating and forming new vestiges of their ilk. It seemed like every cloud was connected, and it was merely weaving into itself over and again forever. Like an upside-down ocean viciously gulping and gurgling against the sky. Dense troughs with whipping crests that flipped across the atmosphere. On the horizon rested a blue sky, with a white light emitting from the very tip of my bridge. I couldn't understand what I was seeing, nor what I was hearing. The winds all around me swirled with reckless abandon. They clawed at my clothes and ripped them against my body like a flag against its post. My helmet groaned under the mounting air pressure. The wind kicked me along the path, not veering me to the side, but not maintaining a stable flight either. I rose upwards like a rocket against the wind. I was sent high into the sky clutching my Maybar with my life. I screamed, gazed down into the waters and saw the bridge, which speared forward indefinitely. An enormous, slithering beast from the deep began to make its presence known. Mountainous, slithering body far beneath the bridge, a number of frilled fringes which sprouted into articulating ligaments. Pale skin, white as can be, Veins and muscles peeking through its thin, taut crust. Its body moved in a great wave. It squirmed across miles with a discerningly elegant motion that fluidly traveled and morphed its muscles along its length. All this below me screaming bloody murder as I watched from way above. Flying with wind moving at an impossible speed. The clouds condensed, their forms becoming clear and prominent. Their power intensified as the skies became a sheet of soft, gray pillows thrown together. My faceplate fogged gently, then it cleared rapidly, revealing the sea below. Above me the clouds stormed, swirling around my position like vultures constructed by gods. Below a mirror of infinity, endlessly echoing the beauty of the heaven-struck sky. I blasted through a cloud with a vague and ever-diminishing blue beam beneath searing into the distant picturesque view. I was slowly released from the wind's push, my legs extended out, and I slowly fell further and further. Gently they hit the bridge, and I skid to an almost immediate stop. After such an experience I was in shock. My breath was light, and I could feel my eyes wobble in their sockets stagnantly dancing to a rhythm unheard of by me. My lower jawbone felt detached. My spine wasn't support. It was a weight that pulled my bones into awkward, horrific, disjointed positions, yanking all my ribs till they pointed at my shoulders as if it were made of lead. My pelvis collapsed into a flat plate, and my legs macerated their forms down to the bone, instantly. The actual pain has subsided by a mounting neurogenic shock. Unfortunately, whatever I was seeing past this point I can't say. My mind conjured any image within the nebula to confuse or collide with me. This went on for a number of hours. It felt far longer. I was feeling such pain but not experiencing it. My hands could have felt on fire but bore no luminance. Finally. 
I woke from this haze. My vision gradually returned, and I could see the bridge in total clarity. I was lying on it. I could see my Maybar, and even the distant stars. At the horizon, I could see the giant diamond synapse that held the opposite end of the platform. My heart fluttered as I began to sprint. I pulled my Maybar out and started running. Each slap of my foot against the hard light sparked like electricity, becoming increasingly powerful with more flashes the harder I ran. My heart pounded in my chest. My feet felt like lead boots that I was built to wear, and my skull thrashed to and fro as my neck became gelatin. A wide smile crackled across my face, punctuating my cheek muscles to their limit, drying my teeth clenched tightly as I hyperventilated. Renewed vigor and grander strength than before, I could feel my body come back to life. However, I had a strange feeling. The pylon wasn't an illusion. At least it seemed. As I neared it, certain things just felt wrong. My sprint had died to a brisk jog, those lead boots had begun to wear at my thighs, and my calves felt like they would tear. Every step was broken glass jammed into my ankles. I had lost sensation in my toes and balls of my feet. I couldn't think clearly, but I knew only to keep going. I actually approached the pylon. This gargantuan device, capable of connecting two arbitrary points in space, was finally within my reach. It was staggering, a bestial monument that dwarfed my understanding of space and size. Just the emitter that held the beam was enormous. As I approached, its form quickly overtook my own, filling my vision with mechanical beauty. But then things began to click together. I watched the pylon. Its lights blipped and beeped similarly to the original, but things weren't right. The whir, the gentle hum of the light bridge, and its emitter produce unbelievable energy. There's no way it would be so. Silent. Usually, you could hear a faint whir that signals the emitter is on. It's gentle but prominent. It also wasn't present. I tried to peer up and down its sides but had no luck. Its vast body took up so much space. Ultimately, I felt hopeless in my search. My body was completely drained. Any and all physical energy was wiped out of me when my excitement was replaced with confusion. This Goliath of engineering, as quiet as a mouse, had just dumbfounded me. I learned as best I could out the right side of the bridge, trying to spot the other end. To my shock and terror, the bridge continued on, its spears right through this pylon and rockets into nothing on the horizon. That's when it hit me. I stabbed my Maybar into the hard light beneath me to absolutely no sound or visual feedback. Just the idle thunk of my spear hitting what felt like stone. I poked behind me and swung its edge at the regions beside what I stood on. No bridge. Just this false one that defied physics. A calm, soothing, yet piercing panic began to gurgle beneath my eyes, growing in the face while warming the neck enticing the jaw to twitch and spasm. I felt utter confusion, complete outrage, utter frustration, just a compulsion to question this one damn bridge. Flabbergasted, mentally distraught, I was just devastated. My mind couldn't let go of the thought that I had only walked right back to the beginning. That idea kept growing as my body kept quaking. To ease said panic, I approached the pylon, and attempted to climb around its edges. One face could fit six people across it, so I had a fair amount of sidling to do. Unfortunately, another wave of fear shot through me like a syringe through the spine, realizing that while disconnected from the bridge, my Maybar was weighing down its cloth strap. There was gravity. Then the fear of falling furthered my panic, making me spasm and nearly lose my footing. If I did fall, I'd accumulate speed until I fell out of whatever gravity well is around here. I'd be rocketing into the abyss. Rounding one corner, I was now on a face with no emitter, an entire wall with nothing to leap to should I lose my balance. 
just the beam which haphazardly seared out the next corner. Each step felt like a leap into infinity, as if I had to consider all of my options before placing my weight onto the metal beam barely supporting me. I sidled with the front halves of my feet on the metal, balancing on the ball of each foot with my chest on the metal surface. To my sides were nothing, just the cosmos so far away I could never dream of touching it. The only perk of being this technologically advanced is the capability of star travel. This is hardly a perk. There I stood, quivering by the strength of the tendons in my heels. Behind me, a fall that would last forever. I am within the grips of some sentience I could never understand, watching minor palpitations and electrical pulsations that skewered between vague clouds that I was swarmed within. This is not something man was meant to endure, hence this protocol. You aren't told as a human to stand face to face with abyssal nature. If sentience can lack a vessel and gain senescence through a nebulon, was our sentience ever meant to compare? All of these questions were impossible before, and we shouldn't have acquired the answers. Such thoughts clattered through my skull, and I ignored them to the best of my ability which caused a clamorous crawl across the pylon's blank, cold, colorless face. I rounded the corner and saw the beautiful blue, a familiar click sound as my boots were pulled onto it, which startled me initially. The second boot came down, and I immediately stabbed the bridge with my maybar. Sparks erupted in full effect, beautiful specks of blue that cascaded into the surroundings. I felt some renewed hope. Turning around, my heart dropped when I found absolutely nothing. No pylon, just the bridge extending back. I felt this sensation urging me to look up, and above me was quite the sight. The nebula's center was above me. I was in between two fields, the first one behind me. I knelt down and held my spear, keeping it clipped into the bridge with all my weight pressed. A strange feeling flooded beneath my eyes again, warm but liquid as if the bottoms were going to erupt at any moment. Of course, tears began to pour, and I was once again crying. I was marveling at the fact that I even made it this far, and the fact that it still wasn't over. An eye had formed from the gases. Bluish iris, black as night pupil, and reddish sclera, which grew outwards in nerve-like trees, which blossomed into an ever-increasing and ever-undulating forest. A forest whose tops are mounted with inflated balloons, and whose tendrils lurk in ever-diminishing light below. No tree trunks, just spinal cords from which the nerves emanate to other ligaments. Long and standing tall, the trees stretched up into the sky from their centers, and eventually fell apart into strands of flesh barely clinging to it, and the eye that flesh was the nerves. It was as if I was glaring into an evaporated person, completely untangled from this knot of existence. Question is, does it think? Do these nerves and sensations, reactions and countermeasures, interactions and aggressions, does this quantify this cloud as living? I thought about it while I looked forward. I could see my bridge continuing onwards, bending gently in response to the field in front of me. This following field holds what just might be the grandest terror. For its nerves reach behind the cloud's eye, they hook into some other part of this thing, something behind the eye. I inched towards its threshold. The anomalous field was so dense you could actually cut it with a knife. I did so with my rod, peeling back a part of the invisible veil with the bladed tip. The segmented part dissipated, falling apart as near-invisible strands and vanishing, as did the wound in the veil the moment I withdrew my spear. Beyond the threshold I could hear the sounds of waves, and this audio only became more potent the longer I listened. All the while the clouds became ever stronger in their reddish and purple hues. My head resisted, as if I moved into a gargantuan tub of molasses which only my skull was affected by. Thankfully, I stayed together, though I do recall my thoughts going numb. I could feel my fingers 
as they shifted in a slightly large glove, each segment of flesh that flexed and relaxed to aid in my movement. It was comfortable. I felt no pain. Nothing of the sort that gave me discomfort. For once, my thoughts had silenced with nothing running the circuit. Not even ideas as to my escape. Just an occasional, reflexive look down to my Maybar as to ensure I was on the right bridge. The clouds motioned in slow, grandiose movements that kept connection through strands of red and black that wove into the confusing web above. Out of nowhere, a mighty thunder erupted to my right. I leapt nearly off the bridge, stumbling with my Maybar out of a quiet, distilled sleepwalk into a hectic storm of growls and snarls. Lights had faded with blooms appearing every so often amidst nothing but black clouds. I could hear air, or perhaps water being billowed beneath great wings. An impressive triple maw appeared beside the hard light, with its six jaws being illuminated as it passed. They began to open just as it drifted into the infinite dark. A brutal roar shook my back, shooting tremors beneath my feet. More thunder, crackling like bones of giants, a powerful thump followed immediately by more hellacious roaring. I could barely keep myself upright, so I knelt and hoped whatever was warring out there would pass. Only after a few minutes did the thunder grow a bit more distant, and despite having no previous reason to, I began to sprint for my life. Booking it down the bridge, I could feel my footsteps growing too heavy again. With scorching muscles pulling it all along, my body was exhausted. The thunder continued, encouraging me despite my incredible pain, furthered by the menaces coming even closer. Their bodies struck the bridge, confirming these weren't a conjuration of the nebula to me. The bridge's entirety flickered and I felt my chest plunge into despair, then lurch back to hope as it remained. Tears streamed down my face as I felt no sorrow, no terror, no pain, even just volition. A finite will to live that's being pushed to its absolute brink. Another lash into the hard light caused another flicker. I nearly fell into it as I turned around to see the creature's teeth clashing, a slithering giant versus some monstrous crocodile. After a peek, I turned and continued sprinting. Focused on the one act of self-preservation, I could see a puny light. The storm's end was near, and all I had to do was follow the bridge. Another flicker tore my attention away. My focus failed for a moment, a single moment. The storm exploded away, the creatures were in the light now, and the law of the bigger fish was demonstrated to me. Both warring monsters clashed once more. A deathlock between their teeth kept them still. From below a grand scene and the most genuine display of this law that I've ever seen. A gargantuan benthic lofid, roof-mounted esca, and miles of gorgeous, towering, gnarly teeth rose from the abyss, its light hauntingly attractive. Before I could react, the two warring ones were snatched up. A motion so quick you'd never believe something that great could move so quickly. Its large eye peered back at me as it fell gently back into the starlight abyss, leaving me and my bridge be, at least for a time. When I turned back the bridge was divided. Once again, I could see it swarming in every direction at once, connecting any two obscure points in space. The only caveat. There wasn't a single one that followed what I could define as straight ahead. I spun 180 degrees around and there was no bridge I could even follow back. I was standing with both sides spewing infinitely to my right and left. Anytime I turned, did any form of motion with my skull, they'd change. They would all change, even the one I was standing on. I watched the bridge spin as I did. Now I hadn't any idea as to how I could get out. There wasn't anything indicating to me where I was in relation to the real hard light bridge. Eventually I chose to run back over the basic stuff. I speared my Maybar beneath me to no electrical pulse behind me in front. You get it. I wasn't detecting any hard light. 
as if I had fallen directly into the grasp of the nebula. That's when it hit me. I fell asleep. I fell asleep during my walk. My Maybar wasn't even on the bridge when I ran from the beasts. Or at least my consciousness might have faltered. I couldn't imagine how long I had been up by that point. The bridges kept turning, spinning, and they were even beginning to warp and curve. All happening too fast for me to keep track of. I finally chose to simply squat down and glare into the bridge. My head was hurting, and my thoughts began to slip. They weren't negative thoughts, simply a throbbing pain and an inability to articulate things mentally. Of course, attempting to recount when your own brain was mush is like trying to account for events in life that happened during the first few years. It's hard to know exactly what happened. Some things are misplaced or misunderstood, but above all else, I did know one thing. I was doomed. I felt total and complete hopelessness as the nebula enthralled me. This was possibly the only moment where I had a single clear thought, a visual. I could see me on my bridge, after all of this effort, being found ages down the line with my Maybar, speared into my throat, body slumped forward on its knees held aloft by the ghastly weapon. Perhaps it would stay where I put it this time. As tempting as this thought became as suicide became a numb idea to my mind, I soon found a strange solace in the nebula. I blinked and looked ahead. My bridge was there again. I was on it. I was holding my spear, and I even tested to see if it was the real bridge. No, but there was only one other bridge. About twenty feet to my left expanding parallel with the one I was on. I slowly stood up, and as I ascended, it all faded. Both bridges began to bleed out of reality as new ones formed in the same confusing manner as before. Slowly, again, I descended. The mess disappeared and the bridges became clear. A confusing situation to be certain, but not an infallible opponent. If I took the leap, it would be in the hopes that the other bridge is real. That I could make it. And that none of that mess gets in the way. I stood again as calmly as I could. I breathed and retained a measured breath, crouching again to get an idea as to how I would do this. After a few squats, I realized I just needed to. So I leapt. My feet left the bridge with abandon. I thrust myself to the nebula and extended my maybar, looking to impale the hard light. This was done mostly with the idea that if it was fake, then at least it would be over afterwards and I could fall into infinity without care, nor idea of remorse. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, I was caught by the ratcheting snarl of plasma, dangling by the rod while contemplating just letting go. I decided it would be a waste to fall, and heaved myself up onto the now comforting hard light. Without vigor, no life in my veins nor will in my soul, as a hollow vessel, I stood back up. Breathing was easy. I had retained my balance. Everything slowed, and I fell into the abyss again. Though it wasn't a gnarly plummet like before, being yanked through a barrier I could feel but not see, it was far more gentle. Calm, even. No war tormented the ambience, and the flourishing sensation around me gave the idea of a breeze or a current. Nothing haunted my light, nothing that moved at the very least. There was, at one end, something that blocked my path. From a distance, all I could see was a marvel. The hard light was blasting into the side of some wall. Another heart drop but without the panic, lightning without thunder as cold washes over my body. You see, these pylons have a caveat, and Omic is well aware of this caveat. You may connect to any of two obscure points in space, so long as nothing goes in the way. In essence, if the connection between the pylons is disrupted while the bridge is in its solid state, it begins to drift after disconnecting. The light is what causes them to remain connected. Photons being solidified constantly throughout their structure ensures their hard light state. 
When large portions of it are shattered, it will spew photons everywhere, thus annihilating whatever synergy was keeping them together. Dramatically so, as stated before, the bridge flickers, and things can be caught within its body. Had the bridge given in, I would have been caught in a horrible explosion. Now, theoretically, when photons are shot in a straight line and come into contact with a surface that cannot absorb it, and one that rests at a 90 degree angle, it will simply bounce back in a straight line again. I have no idea when it appeared, but a sheer wall of stone blocks me, and the photons cannot seem to get through. Approaching it, I could make out its silhouette amidst the clouds of the nebula, now tinted purple and red. It's an unorthodox, or maybe a perfectly efficient structure of alien make. I didn't seem to have a way up, so I improvised. Having no gravity made things a tad easier, but there was seemingly no way to ascend without launching away. Before doing anything drastic, I once again hit the bridge with my spear, and plasma rocketed out of it. I felt a great sense of trepidation. Unfortunately though, I didn't have a choice. The first pylon of the synapse, the second one, and now I can't find the third. For all I know, there wasn't a second, nor a first. At that moment, I really did question everything. I had a choice in front of me. In fact, I had a few. I could have cast myself into the nebula, understanding the futility of every step I took in whatever direction I went in. I could have disengaged my boots, leapt gently into the air, and soared forever into the arms of something I could never hope to understand. Of course, I chose to forge ahead, but with a different understanding. I decided to ascend the wall and find a way in, and hopefully through. If all of this is to research these anomalies and discover the unknown, which was on the tin of the whole derelict ordeal, I had the thought of how many others stopped here, how many others didn't make it. In the end, that futility wasn't anything more than a key to free me from my remorse. A key that set me free to see whatever I wanted to. So I chose to leap up the wall and impale the stone with my spear, carefully aligning my boots with it in the desperate hope they would be magnetic. Thankfully, however, I discovered gravity when I crossed its geometric boundary. More lights were in the distance, a similar blue to my bridge, and I turned back around to see its length once more. If this connection is interrupted, one end of the pylon may go out, and the other will never know forever spewing a stable beam that connects to no end. If my theories were true, then you could say this would be the end of the line for me. The other side may have been offline and disconnected for a while, spinning and turning frantically in the vacuum of space with no direction. My only solace towards this was the fact that it was still activated. Pylons require a counterpart in order to turn on and begin its stream. Once gone, both pylons deactivate entirely. So I hoped that perhaps the anomaly was just making it appear as if it was being disrupted. But the fact that I could physically interact with this place and the sheer size of it was disheartening. It was uncomfortable in the most serene way. My ears rang out with the silence that fumed this place. Grand walls and hallways of complete nothingness. Gray, flat walls. It was deadening to have such a deficit of sensory input. My steps echoed with a gentle tip or tap. Occasionally, my stilted walk and tired demeanor would interrupt the rhythm, but otherwise there were no distractions or disturbances. The numbness bled from my ears to my face, and from my face to my chest and arms. Soon I couldn't feel anything. I even looked down to ensure I wasn't a skeleton, or missing any parts. I had my body, its entirety too. I was pretty together, able to stop to a nauseous halt where I suddenly felt the weight of everything again. Before I vomited, I just kept walking. It was clear my body had no interest in sticking in one spot, despite its exhaustion. All of the halls continued for miles in different lines, and I simply followed the one I thought was at the correct angle from the bridge. Above. There wasn't a ceiling, just the stars with the occasional purple clouds. Barely any light as well. A few lamps way above me that kept the comforting blue in my mind. 
perfectly spaced infinitely down the hall. However, they only shone on the walls, and no light was afforded to the rest of the hallway. Before I could grow annoyed with the lack of exciting ambience, the hall stopped, and an enormous stone staircase was before me. I had a football field length to walk on for each step, but no walls stopped me from going over the sides. I even walked over to take a peek at the fall. Infinite, of course. A rhythm built through the silent ambience, something that grew stronger as I progressed. A constant, powerful rhythm. Not a pulse, but a beat. Slow, intense, louder as I approached what looked to be the most extraordinary door I'd ever open. Massive beyond imagining. I couldn't see its peak due to how it was obscured by the nebula. I followed the stairs up with the surroundings of stars and planets. No walls, just visuals so far away, it'd take your lifetime to get to one. Feeling the beat at the gate, I had nothing but worry filling my veins, an icy feeling of unease. Then the door cracked, air spilled dust from within its crevices, and it slowly opened wide. More darkness, more stone. In my pocket was a small pouch, contained within were capsules of what's known as Cradle. It's a powerful opiate used in the most tense situations. Why? It's our black pill, so to speak, but only if we take five. Otherwise, one pill can knock the pain out of your system, and the worry out of your brain for hours. I may have described some terrible instances thus far, but the key is in lucidity and remembrance. I myself take a fair amount of it, before panic steals away my conscious thought, though my thoughts will be scattered by the drug. Cradle has yet another name in Omic, Panic Pills. Before, when we encountered alien threats across the cosmos, we would often lose derelicts to their own panic or dormant mental conditions. Many have lost their minds in sheer shock and terror. In such instances, wherein you have to enter an oblique, difficult to identify alien structure, you should save these pills for that. You take them down and all the worry leaves. Only conscious thought of the here and now remains. I had five in my little baggie, and I took down one forbidding myself from the option of suicide. Death by cradle is not a fun way to go. I heard it's like being drip-dried on top of a sauna. So little pain you barely notice organs shutting down, muscles feeling like jelly, thoughts raptured by the moment with no ability to remember beyond a day. This is unfortunately a side effect that's hard to avoid, not the death, but the lacking remembrance. A great deal of anxiety is both in fearing the future, but also regretting your past. Assuming you'll make mistakes twice. With that assumption, many can cause themselves to falter at critical moments. Once you take Kratol, everything before you woke up is gone, not permanently, but for a while. Only strong memories remain, teammates and the like, but any mistakes or incorrect answers, misfires, or negligence all gone. As such, you can imagine how easily addictive this substance is. Unfortunately, we have encountered many of these structures. We don't have a name for them yet, and most that we've seen haven't stuck around for long, but one remains stable. Another grand, stoic temple drifting in space, geometric by design, and elegant in its simplicity. The one we found had no strange effects attached to it, no gravity or anomalous interference, so we call it the Mute. I began my walk into a similar stone temple, but found grand effects, one such being a catastrophically loud sound. Nothing ear-piercing or ringing, but bassy and wavy. This sound is one of the more common reasons for people's panic in these places, and upon entering its inner reaches, I felt a growing sense of fear in my chest. Hence, the cradle. Infrasound is a common way for Lamia to put you off your game. It's usually the first move it makes. Now with a rather dull mind that shall only grow duller, I waltzed through the halls of this place, finally closed with a ceiling. The quiet atmosphere made thinking much easier, and it was at this point I attempted to calmly reflect on what had happened to me. 
During this walk, I was torn apart by dread, disparity that reigned when I realized how hard this would be. I was reminded of old wounds, and new ones had unsewn me entirely from my socket simply to reweave me together again. I had seen great monsters war in the depths of an ocean that wasn't even there. Now, I walk through the halls of a grand temple, one that had detached me from my sole objective. Just stay on the bridge. It's challenging to not beat yourself up for failing such a simple mission. I've seen plenty of work in the derelict business. I've worked with Omic for ages, to the point they see me as valuable. Ashveln trusts me with anything. Then I can't follow a straight line. Similarly, it's just as hard to beat yourself up over it. It's not as if I was expected to control the situation, simply get through it. These airy halls filled with nothing provide ample contemplation time, and the cradle has given me a prominent calm to think with. Unfortunately, I had no sense of direction. Before long, the blue lamps had vanished, and I was left wandering in the dark. Only the eerie bloom of the galactic sky, piercing through a hole in the ceiling, aided me in finding anything. Stone floors slammed against my magnetic boots, their weight becoming evident as I plodded through. I looked up to see some of the nebulae, like a borderless, pitch-black window that allowed me a glimpse at freedom. Like being caught in currents, I could feel my whole body shift around, though not violently, gently, powerfully. Before long, I was finally walking towards another burgeoning starlit staircase. It bled from the dark, becoming clearer and nearer. When I noticed it, I was shocked by its presence, but that could be the Kratol. I visibly stumbled once I saw it and continued on into the light. Blanketed in the distant stars, dim rays tinted into a vile pinkish white. The light was blinding but comforting. Peering up the stairs left me annoyed and a little frustrated. All around me were no walls nor ceilings, just the stairs that ascended upwards. There was no temple, as this must have been some city. I could make out individual buildings, some built with weirdly specific architecture compared to the rest. Most buildings appeared built directly into the stone, though lacking any natural formation surrounding it, simple squares or rectangles. Then the specific ones, unique facilities, one which had towers, another had a number of beautiful carvings engraved upon its faces. There were simply too many buildings. I was on a stairway ascending above a city. At the peak of the stairway was something grand. A massive geometric structure that looked rather ancient and had no structural support beneath it. Similarly, the stairs also lacked structure underneath, each step floating at the perfect height. From the maw of this massive structure, a powerful blue light emitted, and it's all I could watch as I stood there mesmerized. The invisible current grew stronger here and it threatened to wobble me right off the side like a harsh wind at the top of a scaffolding. Instinctually and hilariously, I launched my Maybar into the stone, and it ricocheted off. After nearly demolishing one of my only forms of meaningful attack, I decided I had better just book it up those stairs, regrettably checking the blade for any nicks along the way. Starting on the fifth step, I began to jog upwards, speeding up into a sprint. My sprinting eventually grew quite arduous to the degree I slammed onto the flight, heaving. Clearly I needed to take it slower. All this walking has left me completely drained. When I looked back up, it felt as though no distance was gained. Looking behind me, I did confirm that yes, I was still on the fifth step. But I had been walking, and even running for what felt like minutes. Paradoxes happen in these anomalous landscapes, but nothing this blatant. I turned 180 degrees around and backpedaled up the steps, watching as the opening to the temple grew further and further away. After about 10 steps once again I spun around to see no distance, then another spin to see that, factually speaking, I had only moved one step further. Another 360-degree rotation, 
and I was back on that fifth step. Taken aback, I decided to think about my training, trying to avoid being totally aghast at this paradox. Would you believe me if I told you Omic wanted to give you training for what to do in these situations? Too many derelicts have killed themselves once the paradox truly confused them. In fact, this is where panic pills are more commonly used, as paradoxes are far more common than a whole anomalous landscape. Rules exist for a reason, and our brains follow the logical patterns we became accustomed to in order to process the universe. Paradoxes will always break this logic, and anomalous ones can turn fiction into fact. Knowing this, it's important to remember which rules can still exist inside that paradox. Simple tasks can be applied, and you must approach the encounter like a formulaic equation. Find out what the process is. In this instance, I can only ascend stairs if I watch where I come from. Okay, easy enough. The first response is to wear this option out to see its limits. So I once again backpedaled up the stairs, but this time for a significant period of time. Never once turning around, I continued to do so until I was tired. Sat down and resumed once I had caught my breath. I counted the whole way, shoddily, and I climbed 100 steps. I turned around to see no progress and back around to see my reset. Despite the despair that may come from a failed attempt, it's important to remember that you're not expected to get out of here quickly. With this situation, I have plenty of time, theoretically infinite, and a number of other things I can try. I can survey and add a constant to this equation, something to follow. Weirdly enough on that fifth step was the mark made by my Maybar, but it was two minute to see from a distance. However, it is a constant. After two resets, the crack still remains there. I repeated my previous method, backpedaling for roughly 100 steps, but this time I looked down instead of around. After I made it around 50 degrees, I saw the mark, and I knew I had yet to make any progress. Confirmed once I looked back up. Flustered, I nonetheless attempted to remain calm. I again tried the backpedal. However, this time, I left my Maybar on the step. This meant I could begin counting whilst it is going further away, which I did. 100 steps more, and I didn't look down nor around. I didn't break my stare on the Maybar. I instead pulled out my plasma cutter, stupid, helpful tool. I etched a mark into the edge of the step I was on without looking. While not pretty, I looked down at it and found no ulterior mark, nor a Maybar. Only the cut made by my cutter. This is less glamorous a situation than you might think. Anomalies are capable of switching the formula, or its order once you make progress. Instead, you must approach any progress with care and precision. I wouldn't turn around, I simply needed to go get my Maybar. What worked before was having a constant to watch while I made my movements. I put my plasma cutter on the ground, standing upright beside the crack I made with it. Then I backed down while looking at it. Soon enough, I felt a metal dink against my boot, and very slowly, I knelt down to pick it up. At the angle where I could grasp the blade of my weapon, I could only barely make out a single light that rests at the nose of the plasma cutter. Thankfully, I was able to retrieve the rod and make it back to that step. But when I returned to the plasma cutter, I needed to know how to move further more efficiently. This is where any attempted training on the matter gets thrown out the window, and it's down to your personal instinct to defeat these anomalous traps. Personally, I've only encountered a handful of these and had to handle them alone. More often than not, they don't appear where I get sent. Over explaining my failures aside, I didn't even notice when I was put once again at the bottom. Infuriated, I wanted to just walk away, then it hit me. That may be the real goal here. Simply watching the stairs or the mouth of the beginning kept me moving up and down those first five steps. But what if I looked at the temple above and walked backwards? I attempted this and found the strangest thing I've ever dealt with. 
No physical sensation nor extrasensory current could compare to the genuine human feeling of falling backwards on an infinite staircase's bottom, then cracking your helmet on the top. Initially, I was walking backwards down the stairs infinitely, starting on the fifth step. I didn't see anything on either side, and I knew if I turned around I'd still be on the fifth step. I continued this for a bit, and lost my footing, collapsing down the stairs for minutes on end, injured because of how much I flopped and flipped like a fish. A galvanized human slammed the front glass of his helmet on the top step after what felt like 15 minutes of falling. I looked back down, and sure enough, I was on the top. However, at the very bottom, I was just barely able to make out a figure, sitting on his knees glaring up the staircase in a similar manner to me. Up at the top, I noticed that I was in shade, with the final five steps being blanketed in shadow as well. I was flustered at realizing the answer, but I'd imagine everyone does once they see an efficient option to a difficult question. Finally, at the top, I tried to get a grip on myself. The pain was wretched, piercing through my ribs and limbs. A sprained shoulder and wrist clicks in my ribcage as I moved, shooting pain through my spine and a thrashing headache unlike anything before. Though challenging, I managed to get upright. My knees cracked, but had little pain in the joints. My arms and back were demolished, and I had achieved some wicked whiplash by slamming my helmet into the step. The pain was absolutely unbearable, but that's what Cradle is for. Opioids act as sedatives for the central nervous system. I had to take two, and I bet that I spent way longer falling down those stairs than I remember. While it was embarrassing to deal with a paradox, like so it most certainly worked, and now wreathed in total darkness, I tried to stand and find some direction. As a note, I did have a flashlight. They come with every one of these helmets, however it's rather dim and doesn't cover much range. Besides, I had also cracked the lens from my fall. I had become so accustomed to not using it, only following the glowing blue bridge I had previously tread across. A part of me wanted it back, however grueling it was. Better than a temple that bores me to tears and humiliates me with brutality. The visions were terrifying, the sensations were worse, and now I sit in a desolate place with no light to guide my way quite the expedition. I just moved further into the temple in a straight line from the stairs. The sickening silence caused me to flurry my thoughts into disorganized lumps. A genuine nausea was building in my gut, a fear of that silence. How unresponsive it all is now. Colorless. Lifeless. Such a dichotomy is drawn only in these instances. I began to contemplate derelicts, our purpose, what drove me to this point. Not just joining them as I know exploration is a key factor for me, but it's more than that. I drove to be more. Fellows in my early ranks I sabotaged. I despised those who saw nothing in this line of work and quit. I took on whatever missions I could, whatever was asked of me I did, all for the single goal of being one of the best derelicts. As time goes on, you're entrusted with harsher, Weirder, closer to alien workloads. I myself have delved into flesh moons and alien oceans, watched flora on strange planets evolve right before my eyes in response to new conditions. It's the phenomenon, it's the wonder. I saw things I'd never think of, and still do. The danger simply comes with the territory, Omic taught us, and every other operating branch, that these anomalies are not an enemy. They are a threat, yes, but so is getting too close to the sun. So is flying right through asteroids or falling into an alien ravine. The danger is space, never anything more. If anomalies were truly hostile, wouldn't they have the cognition and power to simply accumulate and overwhelm us? They seem to be at odds, like different bacteria in a pond warring on a front unseen and unimagined by man. Perhaps the cradle had truly kicked in there, or maybe the anomaly had yet another effect on me. 
Still, I strutted forward listening to the clamor caused by my heavy magnetic boots in rhythm. No other ambience was here. That specific silence hung around, a kind many men know. It's that silence wherein you feel like your ears are draining or bleeding, as if your brain is melting slowly an artificial layer of crust, which is pulled out by said quiet. Painless but uncomfortable, gentle and hellacious in unison. Time passed and my consciousness waned. I was melting with each step into a puddle of lethargic goo. No visual filled my eyes, but the feeling was there. It didn't take long before I began to question myself. How long was I on that staircase? Did I wait long enough before adding to my dosage of cradle? Questions that truly filled me with terror. I hate lost time and ODing on cradle isn't a fun way to go. I still had two pills left and the pain was mute. The melting sensation, it was all too real, and that's when I started to worry. It didn't feel mimetic or psychic or anything more than real. I kept going, and my gait wobbled. Noises filled the ambience, but a part of me knew they weren't coming from anywhere. The worry turned to quiet panic. My heart rate increased tenfold, and I was sweating viciously. Still, my walk did not break rhythm. I continued with the same beat as before. A nightmare situation and one where Kratal was causing the panic. Repeatedly I reminded myself that I would be fine. That it is simply impossible for me to die off this stuff unless I took down five at once. Then another doubt filled my mind. What if it didn't have to be all at once? What if Cradle sticks around for a while in your system and simply consuming five in a day would result in death? I knew I couldn't take more to calm myself, so I simply focused on my breathing and tried to continue down the dark hall. I arrived at an opening in the temple, a wall with a large hole at one end. Through it was another window of infinity and an eerie, distant song. An organ playing some song I hadn't recognized, a slow one that came through as a strange-sounding lullaby, like a music box made of machines. I walked through the doorway, beginning to feel calmer and clearer as I did so. That calm was necessary, as below was a staircase down, which led to nowhere. A ship was at the bottom, however, a rather large one, immobilized and desecrated. I descended and halfway down, I began to see something extraordinary. A beam of brilliant, bright blue light laid out in a flat bridge extending into infinity from the opposite side of the vessel. Once I got close, it was clear what happened. This ship was struck by the light bridge, causing a surge, likely knocking it into this state. A cold, lifeless vessel drifting aimlessly. I approached and felt something strange. Not a cruel feeling. No pain, nor discomfort, or displeasure. Just a feeling. The moment I approached this wreck, I could see the bridge slamming into the side of the temple, just below our lifeless fellow here. I hopped down and hit the bridge immediately with my maybar, which resounded in a brilliant flare. Passing the ship, I could just about lay my hand on its hull. I did so and felt it further, that strange, odd sensation, that feeling you obtain from making it home after a long day, or when you kick your shoes off, total relaxation and comfort. All my woes washed away. It bore mentioning that the vessel was not of Omic make, nor Gosok, nor Promethean. It didn't even look like a pirate ship. It was a wreck drifting helplessly without power or crew. All it takes is a strong push, and this thing will embark on a journey. So long as it sustains no further impact, it could be moving forever. I gave it a push, a light one, and it very slowly began to move away from me. I felt compelled to try harder, but the pain of my ribcage came through the moment I did. With a saddened heart, I walked away from it, with genuine regret that I couldn't push it into its infinite exploration. Thus I began walking down the bridge, only hoping that this was the right side to be on in the end. The blue was comforting. I felt almost safe on the bridge. Concerns and worry clouded me but the walk was rather nice. Now after hours I saw something, 
a peak, a pinnacle. Gazing around, I saw no nebulae, and turning around revealed to me that I had left the cloud. The warp still encapsulated its body, the clouds tinted blue from the bridge like before. My heart dropped. I nearly collapsed right there and started crying. For that peak I saw was real. I started sprinting, harming my core even more, and exhausting any remaining stamina to simply close the gap a bit more. Not the best move considering my visor was cracked, but I hardly cared. I continued my run, gripping my equipment, scanning the surface of my belts and loops for a specific item. My comms unit. It looks like a walkie-talkie, fitting snugly into your pants pocket with an extendable antenna, yellow frame with a dot in the center, and a wide microphone at the bottom. Double press the button to activate the beacon. Hold it to communicate with anyone nearby. Slowing down, I held the button and requested pickup. No response. So I did it again, waiting for a response. This isn't out of the ordinary. It's rather common. I double pressed the button, and it began glowing red, beeping occasionally and blinking in time with the beeps. Now it was just about getting to the other pylon, which I could see very clearly now. Unfortunately for me, I had to wait even when I got to it. I tapped and kicked the pylon, did everything to assure it was real, and then sat down on its face. First time I had really sat down in a while on my own volition. Serenity passed over me gently. I began to contemplate while breathing, listening to the offbeat beacon's spastic beeps. Clarity resumed, excitement died, and now rest filled my bones, my broken bones. In a matter of hours, Omic finally arrived. I was picked up by Ashveln herself, who congratulated me on making it out of there. Swiftly, too, she requested that I join her in different missions, harsher ones, but I'll have the benefit of a full team who knows what they're doing. Unfortunately, though, this also means my missions will be classified from here on out, so these recordings will likely cease. At least from me. The last mission I spoke on was Lamia Delta, 4. That mission changed me, and so did this one despite it not being nearly as life-threatening. Ashveln asked to see my equipment, looked at my nearly demolished helmet, and asked what happened. I told her everything as I remembered it, and she was curious to see my cradle pouch. I gave it to her without a second thought, and she looked a little shocked. Her gaze went from the bag straight to me, and she asked where they all went. I was shocked too, and I told her that I took three over the course of my walk, one while I was waiting. There should have been at least one more panic pill in there. Ashveln's eyes didn't leave my face, and fairly quickly she suggested that I get to the sick bay, looking confused and concerned. I asked what was up, and she noted that I looked pale, very much so. I don't know if she will let me release the info on my diagnosis, as that's not happening for a bit here. My pupils were puny, and my breathing was a short, pale face, and apparently, I was simply moving and responding slowly, despite me not noticing. She claimed I looked like a corpse, but this isn't uncommon either, 